Father, open your ears to what you want to say to us now from your word. We recognize that all scripture is God-breathed and useful. May it be this little section is useful to us today. We thank you for being here with our brothers and sisters. We thank you we can smile. We thank you we can be light-hearted at times. But Father, when we come to look at your word, it becomes serious business. So enable us to focus on what we hear your son say from the cross today. We thank you, however, that he's no longer on the cross, but he's risen and glorified. What we're going to be looking at today just briefly is the third of the sayings of Jesus from the cross. If you remember, there were seven of these sayings. Uh, the first one was, Father, forgive them for they know not what to do. Always intrigues me as to whether that prayer was actually answered and how it was answered, but that's not for now. Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. And the second one was to the repentant thief on the cross. And to him it was said, this day you will be with me in paradise. And again, there's discussions about what paradise meant at that time. But never mind, it's a good promise. Today, you'll be with me in paradise. The next one, which we're going to look at briefly. Woman, behold your son. The next one, and it's getting nearer the end, shall we say. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Next one, number five, I thirst. Number six, it is finished. He said in a loud voice, it is finished. And then finally, into your hands, I commit my spirit. Incredible to think that these seven sayings were all uttered while Jesus was on the cross. Let's just read this short reading again from John 19. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there, and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, the disciple, this disciple took her into his home. Of the four gospel writers, John is the only one who records Mary's presence at the cross. But it would be expected that Mary would be in Jerusalem for the time of the Passover. But would you have expected her to be at the cross? We know that every year his parents went to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover, says that back in Luke 2. Probably after Joseph's death, Mary would still come up to Jerusalem every year for the Passover. We don't actually read that Joseph has died, but it's widely assumed that he had died. Uh, I can't imagine that he's gone away, but you, we just don't know that. We assume that Joseph had died by that time. So Mary would have come up, no doubt, with friends and relatives. To come up to Jerusalem, I wonder how much she actually knew about what was going to happen or what was happening to Jesus at that time. Probably quite a lot, but again, we're not fully sure because you come a distance. But her son is in trouble. He'd been arrested, he'd been tried, he'd been condemned, and now he was dying. So surely you could say, well, I can understand why Mary should want to be close to her son. And I expect at that time she remembered what Simeon had said to her at uh, Jesus' dedication, as it were, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. I mean, it's, we tend not to think very much about Mary. It's not a thing we do because she's often misrepresented as to her importance, but she's still someone that we should think about. And she was greatly honoured in what she was chosen to do 
but she was just a woman. There was nothing else. She had no special powers. So she's near him now, but she's near him with what must have been a broken heart. Can you imagine it? Watching someone you love, your son, your adult son in the prime of life, being put to death for on spurious charges. So she's there, her heart is broken, and she's consoled by friends. Who's there with her? Well, there's Mary, wife of Clopas, Mary Magdalene. There's three people there at the cross with her. Um, Jesus' mother's sister, the mother of James's sons, St. Jebedee's sons, who's called Salome, we think, if you look at other scriptures. Mary, the mother of James, the younger, and Mary Magdalene. So Salome and two other Marys also there with her. And the story goes on. When Jesus saw his mother there, I wonder how he would feel about that. He'd done everything you had to do. In a sense, you know you've got to go down this route because he'd set his face as a flint towards Jerusalem. I don't think for a minute he'll have prepared his mother and, and, and caused her to go through the agony of waiting for this to happen. I, don't, I, don't, I can't imagine. I can't imagine that. So his first words at this point were to his mother. And he says, dear woman. Not, not dear mother, but dear woman. Lots of discussion as to why he said dear mother, dear, dear woman and not dear mother. Some say it was a term of respect. Some to say that in the end, in the end of the day, she's no more important than any other woman. I don't know the answer to that one, but he says, dear woman, here is your son. You know, for a long time when I read that, uh, these words, I'm thinking that he's talking about himself at that point. Dear woman, here is your son. This is where he's finished up. But actually, that's not what Jesus is saying at all. Because Jesus, the next thing Jesus says is when he turned to John and he says, here is your mother. Here is your mother. So this passage is really very much about relationships. Yes, of course, it's about part of the story of the crucifixion about, of Jesus. But when you look at what actually happened and what was actually said, it's quite profound. Dear woman, here is your son. Talking not about himself, but about John. John could never be a, a Jesus replacement, of course. But what Jesus was really saying, I believe, at that point was, here is someone that's going to be like a son to you, in the sense of caring for you, in the sense of looking out for you, in the sense of seeing how it's going, seeing the learning you need. Here is your son, who happened to be a very busy man, I'm quite sure, but also, dare we say, a very godly man. And then he says to the disciple, John, here is your mother. Well, obviously, she wasn't John's mother. But he's saying to John, here is someone who you're going to love by caring for her. She's going to love you as if, she, as if you were her son, even though you have no blood connection with, them, with us at all. So there's this cementing of a relationship in Jesus with two people <clears throat> who I'm sure had never lived in the same house before, hadn't grown up before, were of noticeably different characters and backgrounds, and because they're connected spiritually to Jesus, they've suddenly become part or aware they're part of this one big family. In a sense, if that's the same with us, we are part also of one big family. And we have the passage finishes up with this little phrase, from that time on, this disciple took Mary into his own home. Different people have got different opinions as to where they finished up living. Some say they went to Ephesus, some say they went somewhere else, it doesn't matter. 
from that time on, John took responsibility for the earthly needs of Mary, the mother of Jesus. So how does that affect us? I'm being a bit practical today. I think we must love our own parents or our own children for that matter. I don't know how many of us have got parents are still alive, but a few of us have, not me. We must love our parents no matter what. Some of our parents or some parents misunderstand their children or disapprove of decisions that we make. Sometimes they can hurt us grievously. I remember my daughter when she was 19 decided uh, to go off around the world with a friend. We finished at university, decided to work her way around uh, the world for two years with a friend from university. Uh, neither myself and Myra at that time were particularly comfortable with this idea. However, my daughter Lois uh, was a very committed Christian and we had faith in her that she wouldn't do anything stupid. She was intelligent and the two years uh, went really well. And she's now back and she's got a family and she's got a dog that we are trying to look after this weekend because it's a monster. But we love her, despite anything she might have done. But she's been a good daughter. She's, she's now a church warden at St. Mary's Longfleet and Pool, whatever a church warden is. But there we are. You've got to love people. My brother has no time for Christianity. He's never, he's a rich man. He married a millionaire. He's never given a penny to Myra's Wells. He's lost his whatever faith he had, I think because his father sort of put him off Christianity by, by the way he was treated. But I've still got to love my brother because that's what I should do. So he's there when, if, if ever, he decides that he needs me. So even if other family members misunderstand us or disapprove of what we do, they hurt us perhaps, then... We still have to love them. There was somebody I know who was brought up in a, a very strict uh, brethren assembly and he decided he was called to be a minister in the Church of Scotland. His father wouldn't let him back in the house because there was still some people in the Church of Scotland, they're heretics, you know, and they don't believe in this, they don't believe in that. But he, want, he went and he's a very good pastor in the Church of Scotland uh, in a very healthy church. That was God's plan for him, I'm quite sure. But his father rejected him because he was part of a, what he called a denomination. So I must love my dad or my child, even if, even if they don't go the straight and narrow way. There's people I know not very far from here, not in the town, but it's very near here. I'll pass it on the way home so I'll give you a clue. And their son finished up embezzling money. And there was no reason why he needed to, but he did, and he finished up in Dorchester Prison. They could have said to them, don't want ever you to set, house, set foot in this house again. But they didn't. They didn't condone what he did, but they still loved him. But even Jesus, in his short time here, he felt the hurt of misunderstanding from his family. He wouldn't think that would be possible, even his mother. It's apparent that during the part of his ministry, or at least part of it, his family didn't understand him. So if you're a young person here today and you don't think your parents understand you, then well, Jesus was in exactly the same boat. So take comfort from that. At the wedding of Cana in Galilee, for example, you remember the time that uh, Jesus changed the water into wine? Obviously, it wasn't a brethren wedding, but he changed the water into wine. And Mary decides to intervene and tell him to hurry up and go on with it. Change that water into wine. Jesus gave a strange reply, my time has not yet come. We can think about that in your, in your own time, really. Another occasion in Mark chapter 3, uh, his family thought, he's out of his mind. He's out of his mind. They thought that about Jesus, out of his mind. People still think that, of course. His brothers, apparently, along with Mary, thought that Jesus was off the, off the, off the track. And John 7 verse 5 says this, even his own brothers did not believe in him. Do you not think that's quite incredible? They would have known about all the miracles that he'd done. They would have known what he, how he spoke. They would have known uh, his track record. They would have known how much he knew of the, the Jewish history and all the rest of it. 
and they did not <coughs> believe in him. It's one of the hardest things to understand, isn't it? But whether people understand, whether we understand or even approve, whether we can even trust people in our family, in our lives, we are told, honour your father and your mother. And can keep believing that Christ's powered love, Christ's powered love can heal the hurts from our family. And lots of families have got hurts. I didn't have a very happy uh, childhood. My father was extremely overbearing. I've got some of his characteristics of being a bit loud and a bit self-opinionated, but I'm aware of that a bit and try to be, <laughs> try to be a good boy. But he would not, he would not uh, have any nonsense. And the trouble is people around him knew what he was like. He was a clerk who worked in the building trade and everything had to be perfect. The swimming was a swimming pool in air getting built where we lived and they, it was supposed to be open in July one year and the contractors in March had, had put the tiles on in the swimming pool and he came and inspected the tiles and said, they're not on correctly, you've got to take them all off and put them on again. And there was a big outcry because the opening was going to be delayed. So they did all this and then they put the tiles on again just in time for the opening, and he came and inspected it again and said, these tiles, they're not on properly, they're going to fall off, you've got to take them off. And he was overruled by the council, and the swimming pool opened, as it should have done, on the date specified. That was until October, when all the tiles started falling off the swimming pool, and they had to shut the thing. But, you know, he was right, but he made sure that people knew what he thought. And so I, I lived, I was walking in eggshells all the time. I was really walking in eggshells and I had to be careful of the company I kept and well, that was probably a good thing. But then I got a phone call. My father got a phone call one day and the phone call said, this is Mr. Abercrombie. My father said, who? Mr. Abercrombie from Mabel. I just want you to tell your son not to buck about with my daughter. You see? I wasn't in. So I came home and he said, you're grounded. I said, I'm grounded, why? I've had Mr. Mr. Abercrombie on the phone from Mabel. Who's Mr. Abercrombie? He's the man whose daughter you've been mucking about with. I said, I, I've not been mucking about with him. I don't know any Mr. Abercrombie. Oh, he wouldn't believe me. He just would not believe me. So I was grounded for a period until I think he began to realize that this was one of my funny friends really trying to make life difficult for me. And he succeeded very well, but of course, my father just believed that he was right and nobody would do a thing like that. So it was hard for me, but I still love my father. Or well, I did, he's gone now, of course. And one of the reasons I, I love him is because he took me to church every Sunday and I was exposed to God's word. And some of it is well and truly hidden in my heart. And that's a good thing and it outweighs the bad things. But he wasn't a loving father and my mother was even scared of him. So these family situations can wind us up and annoy us, but we've really got to ask God to help us to be the kind of people that he wants us to be in such difficult circumstances as will happen. And some of the people we meet, they will be in similar circumstances as well with trouble with their parents. Bradley, who used to be in our house, Graham, he, his father wouldn't talk to him because of how ridiculous he'd been. But all over the place there's dysfunctional families because the family unit is not what it should be according to God's plan. So we, knowing what God's plan is, should work towards improving what we can and asking God to help these people. We have to put, however, commitment to God above commitment to our family. Commitment to what God wants us to do doesn't remove our family responsibilities but it's more important. Our obedience to Christ must be primary and our obedience to our parents or our family becomes secondary. Just because we are Christians, just because we are missionaries, just because we are church leaders or whatever we are, doesn't absolve us of family obligations. The Apostle Paul is quite clear about this. He says here, 
If anyone does not provide for his relations, and especially for his immediate family, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. I want you to think of that, I'll read it again. I want you to think of that verse in the context of the social care crisis that we've got now. Read it again. If anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for his immediate family, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. One of the reasons that we've got this social care crisis is because families are not willing to take responsibility for their elderly family members. It's not always easy, maybe not even always possible, but it would be a lot of the time. I take loads of people, I've probably told you this before, to hospital in Bournemouth and Poole. Many of these people are people who have moved down from the Midlands or London or wherever to this area for a nice happy life in the retirement as a, as a couple of pensioners. And then one of them dies, and the other one is left alone and becomes pretty helpless. Meanwhile, the families are all over the country, or indeed all over the world. And mother or father is forgotten. Oh, I've left home now, that's not my problem anymore. But it is. You have got a responsibility to your family. I could always remember being in Brazil on one occasion, and up the jungle, as you do if you go to Brazil sometimes. And I was taken to this house in a tree somewhere, and I went in there, there was a text on the wall, Psalm 91, verse 1, which I was encouraged by. And uh, I asked, talking to the family through the interpreter, and uh, there was only women there. And I said, where are all the men? Oh, one of the women said, my daughter's getting married soon. And the men have all gone to build them a the new couple a house. Because you couldn't ever send your daughter off to be married and not have a house for them to live in. When would you ever think of having to supply a house to your children before they got married? It just wouldn't happen. But really, it's all part of this care for the family. In Burkina Faso, well, there is no social care. So in a village, there'll be 20 people in a household, an extended household, and the younger people will care for the very old if they live to be very old, which is not common. So there's a really family responsibility comes out of this little story. Woman, here is your son. <laughs> Look after him. And to John, here is your mother. You take care of her as long as she needs your help. I wonder how we think about our own responsibilities. Sometimes we can take rash decisions about our family needs. Decisions that weren't filled with Christ's love. But our priorities should be clear. First of all, God himself. Worship God, love your neighbour, and our work for God. These are the three things that are most important and the order in which we will do them. How do we reconcile these things? It's quite difficult. How to put Christ first doesn't always mean that we're just then free to neglect everything else in our life. Sometimes we may have to. It doesn't always mean that. It means that we need to get our priorities right in relation to each other, each other and only God can sometimes give us the wisdom to do that. Karen was not not feeling too well this morning. She's got this ridiculous cough and sneezing and all the rest of it. And what I, I don't know what I should have said, mind you, but what I should have said and didn't was, do you want me to cancel this morning? Do you want me to stay here and, and just make sure you're all right? She's not that bad, or I would have done that anyway. But I didn't even say it. I couldn't have said it, but I should have. Because it, these things are, are more important at times. I'm sure you would have survived if I hadn't come here today. Hopefully, hopefully you'll survive with me. But it priorities and the wisdom to know what to do. The wisdom to know what to take on and what not to take on. My dear friend Stephen Gillum, who comes to you, he never stops unless God stops him. And he's a wonderful man and he's greatly, he's, he, you know, he'll, he'll got a lot more stars in his crown than I'll ever have. But he just never stops. I'm not sure that's right. Jesus said, come ye apart and rest a while. So getting things in balance, loving and serving 
and, and worshipping God and giving him first place is important. Then our family, then anything else he wants us to do. But at the end of his life, with Jesus dying on the cross, you wonder how he's even able to speak. But what we see is the tender love of a son for a mother, even a mother who had misunderstood him, because she did misunderstand him. As he dies, he settles his earthly obligations as best as he can. We hear him say these words, woman, and pointing to John, here is your mother, here is your son, and to John, here is your mother. Let's pray. Father, in very difficult situations, we see Jesus' example of love and family responsibility. And yet, although we know that many family relationships are all hunky-dory, wonderful, loving, sometimes it's not like that. Sometimes they are complex. Sometimes we're, we don't understand those around us and how they behave. Sometimes we hurt them, and sometimes they hurt us. Father, we're in a, often in difficult situations, so we, we ask that going forward, you would maybe enable us from time to time to reflect on the concern that Jesus had for his family, for his mother, at, at this most difficult time, and help us to emulate that example by being more concerned for others than we are for ourselves. Show us how to love you at the same time as we love our family members. Give us the wisdom we need so that we can love our family and indeed each other as Jesus loves. We ask this in his precious name. Amen. Okay, let's have our final hymn. It's a good strong hymn, so we'll expect a bit of enthusiasm before your coffee. My hope is built on nothing less. <laughs>